Hey, this is Brett, and you're watching Brett and Some Books. Uh, today we're continuing The Bosnia List by Keenan Travinchevich and Susan Shapiro. Um, this is Chapter 8, Their Side of Town, Grbavica, Bos Bosnia, July 2011. Don't grill them about the war, Alden warned me as we headed to our historic lunch date on the other side of Birchkow on this warm Wednesday in July. Don't make me lotion Zorica uncomfortable. They're good-hearted. We'll be guests in their home. Just leave it alone, my father added, as if social etiquette trumped understanding of the real reasons our people were almost annihilated. Come on, don't you find it weird that the guy who helped us at night was shooting Muslims by day? I asked. The point is that he did help us. Dad said, that's all. Well, Eldon was in casual beige cargo shorts and a t-shirt, and I was in khakis and a hoodie. My father decided to deck out for a special occasion with his favorite jazzy fuchsia button-down shirt, black slacks, and a jacket with a matching tie. I knew Dad felt pure gratitude toward Miloš and Zorica, and didn't care to probe the deeper reasons they'd assisted our family. For me, it was much more complicated. I needed to know why these Serbs were the only neighbors who'd come to our aid, though they'd been strangers who mysteriously moved in below us during the war. What had they really been up to? Number eight on my list was, ask Zorica if she felt guilty taking over my friend Huso's apartment, and Milos was the only Serb I knew who might admit he regretted fighting against us, so I could fulfill number 10. I just can't talk about weather and soccer, I argued, looking for Milos's taxi. Enough with your damn list already, Eldon was walking too close to me. Can't you just let it go for one meal? I wasn't a kid you could control anymore. Stop being my shadow, I snapped at him as I spotted Milos leaning against his car doors, his car's open door. He was smiling and waving at us with both arms, like a long-lost buddy, now fifty-five, He'd grown a belly since 1992. I'd never seen him out of the green Serb camouflage uniform I'd despised. Unarmed, in jeans and a short-sleeved shirt, he no longer looked threatening, more like a jovial middle-aged uncle. Yet my 12-year-old eyes still saw an enemy soldier with an assault rifle over his shoulder. Milos had parked in front of the library, a landmark building partly destroyed in the fighting. It had been renovated, repainted to resemble a regal Budapest castle. I took a picture. I'd been capturing images of bombed out monuments, homes in war and office structures riddled with bullet holes and shattered windows that now filled the memory card of my digital camera. I was drawn to the ruins. They mirrored how I felt. I didn't know what troubled me more. Sites in my homeland that remained wrecked, or ones that were spruced up as if nothing horrible had happened here. It's been twenty years, but they say true friends always find each other, Milos called out when we approached. His six-foot-two frame towered over Dad as they embraced. Then Eldon, who was taller and thinner, hugged him, and they patted each other on the back. I'd know you anywhere, Milos said, now turning from me. I'd never touched him before, not even a handshake. I flinched and then gave him a quick guy hug, but he grabbed and squeezed me so hard my feet lifted off the ground. It was odd to think that I was about the age he'd been during the war. At 30, I still felt like a kid. I wondered why he was so eager to reunite. In two decades, not one of my old Serb classmates had ever made contact. I would have thought Igor Delibor and Delibor would have been at least Googled us or followed me and Eldon in our Facebook to see if we'd survived. What a nice clean car, Thad told Milos, getting into the passenger seat as Eldon and I crawled in back. I was struck that a college graduate had to drive a cab to support his family. Serbs thought they'd be better off without us, yet now they all had loss. The, the taxi Milos drove 
His all gray hair and his lined face told me he'd been treading turbulent waters since we'd left. I wanted to believe that his warmth was meant to make up for his past sins on the battlefield. Eldon put his hand on my knee to stop my legs from fidgeting. I was anxious to get beyond these polite exchanges. I wanted to quiz Milos to see if he had any regrets. There is plenty of food to eat and rakia to drink, Milos told us. Zorika's preparing everything. Going to their home felt in too intimate. I should have treated us all to a nice meal at a restaurant. But when I'd refused Zorika's offer to stay with them, she'd insisted on cooking for us. I didn't want to insult her, since so many Muslims from here now came back to spend their summers in Birchkow. I hoped they wouldn't ask why we'd waited so long to visit. What would I say? We hold a grudge against mass murderers. Please pass the potatoes. If, like all the other Serbs we'd met here, Milos complained of the lousy economy, I'd want to yell, That's what you get for your ethnic cleansing campaign that destroyed the country. I was hyper to hear the answers to questions that had been churning in my gut all these years. How could they just take my pal Huso's furnished apartment, sleep in his parents' bed, use their blankets and sheets, and eat from their plates? I wanted to know why Milos secretly fed us, but then turned around and killed Bosniak boys in the field. After World War II, Germany apologized to Jewish victims of the Nazis, offering them billions in reparations. Yet the German militia who invaded Poland and Russia had no intimate connection to the Jews they persecuted. In the Balkans, it was a classmate or co-worker holding a gun to your head, and now they were sitting in your local bar, wanting to share a drink. There had to be one Christian soldier here who would admit that killing their Muslim neighbor was wrong. Milos and Zorika were the sole Serbs we planned to break bread with. This was my only chance. Yet if I was rude, I would shame my father and the memory of my mother. Driving into Grbavica, a, a Serb subdivision, my palms grew damp. I, it was one in the afternoon, 75 degrees outside and sunny. I hoped we wouldn't sit outdoors and mingle with, each, with other neighbors. If Milos said, This is Sinahed, Eldin, and Keenan, our names would be would immediately tell their orthodox Serb crowd our faith. As we drove closer, I got paranoid, picturing Serbian flags flying, uh, bells flying from churches, ringing on all sides, seeing a poster of Milosevic, the Balkan Hitler, hanging in the window of a Serb apartment would make me want to throw a rock through the glass but I had taken care to wear a short-sleeved striped shirt that covered the old Bosnian flag on my arm. Milos and Zorica had been respectful of our plight and apartment during the war. I wouldn't disrespect them in their home, but I didn't want to stay long either. The night before, I'd been frantic that I was just halfway through my list and had only had a few days left of my trip. I needed to speed it up to finish what I came for. Number nine was apologize to Huso for betraying him, so I decided to phone Huso to confess my guilt over our friendship with the Serb family who'd stolen his apartment. From recent emails back and forth, I'd pieced together what happened over the last 20 years to Huso, my old Muslim neighbor and close friend. His mother had worked with my mom. His father, Hassan, was a professor my father highly respected. After Huso's dad had fought with Obrin in our building in 1992, their family fled to Croatia and then wound up in London. Hassan, still a bit of a political hothead, had published editorial pieces railing against the British for their pro-Serb stance in the Balkans. Huso's parents had divorced, and he was now living in Sarajevo with his wife and baby daughter. He had a good job working for an American consulting company. I wonder how much he remembered from the war. Dialing his number, I was nervous. We hadn't spoken to each other since we were kids. Oh shit, you're in Bosnia. What's up, Kenji? He stunned me using my old nickname. His voice was deeper and more mature, but he still had his northeast Bos Bosnian accent. 
How did you know I was here? I asked. Caller ID shows local call. So are you in your Sarajevo? No, birch cow. But you swore you'd never return. Only promise I ever broke. But we had to come back for Dad. Hope it goes well for him. Huso said stiffly, then added, I don't ever want to see birch cow again. Clearly I wasn't the only one with lingering resentment toward my hometown, but Huso didn't like his new town any better. Although Sarajevo was once again touted as the cosmopolitan capital of Bosnia, with synagogues, mosques, and Catholic and Orthodox Christian churches side by side, the high unemployment rate was ruining the whole country. Last week, I was in the grocery store at 5 p.m. with my daughter in the stroller when there was an armed burglary with two guys with AK-47s, Huso told me. There's different mafias and ethnic divisions on every level. Federal, state, education, the court system. Everyone's corrupt here. No one has any money. I want to move to Canada. As his Bosnian-born contemporary, I sympathized. Yet the purpose of my call wasn't to commiserate about the continuing political corruption of the Balkans. I needed to share a shameful secret that had been gnawing at me since I was twelve. I couldn't expect other people to rectify their war sins without atoning for my own. If I didn't share my remorse now, I never would. Clutching my cell phone, my hand was shaky. You so, I have to tell you something that's been bothering me for a long time. Growing up, Huso's professor father and neatnik mother had been very strict about which of his friends should come over to their place to play and win. You had to take off your shoes before entering, go straight to Huso's bedroom, and not make a mess anywhere else in the house. You couldn't touch the crystal or ceramic figurines on their shelves or cabinets or eat anywhere but in the kitchen. So I felt horrible chasing day on through the rooms after Huso's family fled, as if an intruder violating all their house rules. I used to go from their front door straight to Huso's room, so I'd never even seen their whole apartment until Zorica moved in. She insisted I play with Dayan in the living room and dining room floors, where we'd have snacks and make a mess and leave Huso's toys strewn around. After you left Birchkow, the Serb family who moved in came up and befriended us. They invited me over to play with their son, I blurted out. I'm sorry, I was hanging out in your apartment without you being there. I shouldn't have invaded your privacy. I pictured how we'd crashed Hugh So's many church cars. He'd had the same Rolls Royce, Mercedes, and Volkswagen I did, scuffing up their nice parquet floor, and I'd turned the pages of his 1990 World Cup soccer album, sifting through his beloved trading cards, which I should not have touched. I wasn't brave or strong or old enough to take a stand back then. I shouldn't have been in your room without you or playing with your toys or... Can you really? He cut me off. Are you kidding me? His tone changed. He seemed offended. I was afraid he'd hang up on me or that he'd demand all the sordid details and then tell his father who would lose respect for my dad. But Hugh so deserved to know what happened where he used to live. It was his story, too. Even if I'd sinned, I cared deeply what he and his father thought of us. If I'd left a shadow on our family's name, I don't. I didn't want to compound it by continuing the lie. That's why you're calling me? Huso sounded upset. I felt distressed. Please don't be angry. I'd hate for him to see me as weak or a double-crosser who'd betrayed him the minute he left town. I am angry, Huso said. Because you are being ridiculous. We are old friends. You are of my own. You survived day by day at twelve, and when your job, your only job, should have been having fun. Instead, we were attacked by those cowardly hyenas. It was naked survival. Twenty years earlier, Bosniaks I knew had called Serbs hyenas after the animal known for its maniacal laugh and for ganging up on bigger creatures only in large herds. Sometimes they would steal a lone baby cub, but they never attacked one-to-one -one when the fight would be fair. Huso wasn't in Birchkow for the war. I was glad he was understood how bad the occupation was. 
My home was your home. I can't believe you felt bad about it all this time. No need to feel ashamed, Kenji. So we're good? Hyuso asked. We're good. I let out a long sigh, feeling lighter but a little silly, as if I'd just sped through all the years from 12 to 30 in one phone call. Hyuso went on to explain that his dad had filed for property return to reclaim their apartment after the war. While angry they couldn't move right back into their home, Hyuso's family made a deal with Milos. They would wait for him to vacate the apartment so long as Milos would not rip out electrical wiring, remove sinks, tubs, and outlets, trash the place, or strip it bare, as many Serbs did when they were forced out of the homes they'd usurped. I was pleased to hear him say that Milos and Zorika had left their apartment spotless. Any chance you can come to Birchkow? I asked, sad we'd missed out on so many years of friendship. I can't. I'm working and taking care of my little girl. Can you come to Sarajevo? I wish I could. I'd never been there before, but it was five hours away. I'm stuck here with Dad and Eldon and visiting all our relatives. I'll call you after I see Milos and Zorica today to tell you how it goes. Yeah, good luck with that, Huso's tone was sarcastic, as if I was fraternizing with the enemy. For a moment, I felt like I was entering Huso's place without his parents' permission again. I had committed a sin against my friend, sitting on his bed, eating off his plate, with his fork and his spoon, I knew I was just a kid during the war. In fact, Huso would probably be pleased that under his roof, Milos and Zorica had fed and protected us. Speaking with him now, I realized what I'd experienced as unjust 19 years before was not my imagination. My moral compass was right to point towards shame. What happened at Huso's home was twisted and wrong. It just wasn't my transgression. I felt embarrassed yet grateful to be able to check off number nine. I still had a nagging sense that I should have been reuniting with Huso today instead of the people who had displaced him. Pulling into the unpaved driveway of Milos and Zorica's new two-story house, I noticed that the brick walls had no paint and the front stairs were without railings, as if the work had been halted in mid-construction. I took it as a sign they were broke. Zorica rushed out to greet us. She was heavier, wrinkled, and looking older than her 54 years. I could tell she'd had it rough since we'd kissed her goodbye for that freezing night 19 years ago. She'd sneaked us moonshine and money to escape. You're here, she smiled. Come in, come in, Keka. I would recognize. Keenan's a younger version of his dad. Elden I'd never know without his big glasses. I got contact lenses in college, my brother said. I hoped she wouldn't kiss me three times on the cheek, the serb ritual. I didn't want to impose the Bosniak way of kissing twice, so we only kissed once, American style, an unspoken compromise. Then we embraced, and she ran her hands through my hair, and all my old affection toward her rushed back. Dad and Eldon gave her a kiss on the cheek, too, and then deep hugs. We took our shoes off before entering, a Balkan custom we all shared. As we walked in, we gave them a bottle of our favorite aged scotch whiskey from Milos and a makeup kit with lotions and perfume I'd picked out for Zorica. She opened hers, put a little cream on her hand. How nice it smells! You can't get this here! It's the kind my father used to bring me from Germany. I looked around. The beige 80s decor of their living room took me back in time. Luckily, no photos of Milosevic, just a cross hanging in the foyer and a picture of the bearded Orthodox Christian Saint Lazar. Good, I preferred martyrs to war criminals. I was very clean, though it confirmed that they were not well off. It was very clean, although it confirmed that they were not well off. Dad went for the couch to my left. I sat on the adjacent sofa, and Eldon took a seat next to me. Although we'd never set foot in this new house, everything seemed familiar. Just visiting a family home in the country of my birth was triggering all sorts of memories. I'll open your special scotch, Milos offered. 
No, that's just for you, I told him. To save for another day, my father added. Then you must have some of my homemade rakia. Milos poured us shots. We toasted, saying, Zhvili, meaning may you live forever. Wow, this is smoother than we get in New York, I marveled. You don't have Bosnian plums growing in your backyard like I do, he said. Give it a minute. Milos's pride, sharing his best drink with us, charmed me as the rakia scorched my stomach. The heat expanded upward. Oh, yeah, my eyes are burning. It breaks my heart your mother isn't here, too, Zorika said, and we all nodded. Two weeks earlier, I'd found her number in Mom's old phone book. I was just thinking about Adisa, she said when I called. I'd broken the news that my mother had died from ovarian cancer in 2007 over the phone. Then, Zorika was in remission from breast cancer herself, she told me, after a lumpectomy and radiation. She said she was trying to quit smoking and eat healthier. She asked more about my mother's illness, but I wasn't up for talking about it. Now I kept glancing around, feeling like I'd been here before, though I was positive I'd never visited the neighborhood. Nice wooden flooring. Right after the war, I took these Japanese diplomats around Bosnia. They, played, they paid for the parquet floor. Milos laughed. I felt bad charging them so much, but they needed to be driven to Sarajevo four hours away. It cost a mint. Armies were disbanded, and everyone still had weapons. I was scared driving through Bosniak territory with all those flags waving. This could be my opening. Why were you scared? I asked. He took out a pack of Morava cigarettes and lit one. Cyrillic writing, a Serb brand. I didn't want to be stopped at checkpoints or shot. I would have loved to witness that role reversal, a Serb military man fearing armed Bosnians. I was about to ask if Milos still had his gun, but Eldon gave me a look that said, Don't go there. I wished he and my father weren't there so I, could, so I wouldn't be inhibited. Rest your feet. Be comfortable. Zorika moved an ottoman in front of Dad. He obliged, lifting his legs up. She put a pillow behind me. Relax, it's your home too. Her words took on deeper irony as I spotted my mother's two paintings of red flowers on the wall, still in their copper frames. The matching Art Deco acrylics used to hang in our birch cow apartment. I was shocked to see them again. I put my drink down and ran my hand over the four-foot light wood table with a glass top. Growing up, it had graced our living room. Against the wall, I caught sight of the cabinet where I used to store VHS horror tapes when I'd watched them with Huso. Zorika saw how startled I was. Your mother told us to take whatever we could from your apartment. She stared at the pack of cigarettes on the table but didn't take one. Keenan! Tell me what you recognize. I looked around more carefully and realized we were surrounded by furniture from my childhood home. I felt misplaced, as if an alien family had abducted my past and was living my former life. How many other Serb houses were the lost treasures of my people scattered through? The table, the cabinets, the rose paintings on the wall, and the electric heater, I said. It had wheels on the bottom. I recalled how, when Huso and I would come home from sledding, we'd sit on it to get warm. And the gold light fixture. I looked up to see its two long, narrow bulbs. You should take it all home to New York with you, Zorika offered. Don't be crazy, I answered, but if Mom was around, I would have brought her back a token for nostalgia. It rightfully belongs to you, Zorika said. No, it's yours, it's yours. No, it's yours, it's yours, Dad insisted. He lifted his eyebrows to say, if they could afford better, they wouldn't have kept it all for two decades. For a moment, I considered taking back my mother's roses, but Dad was right. Zorika and Milos didn't have much. If I left their wall empty, I'd feel like I was robbing them. The walls of my queen's pad were crowded with Bosnian photographs and posters. Anyway, 
Zorika was the Serb who most deserved my mother's possessions. I recalled how thrilled Mom was to be reunited with all our old photo albums when Zorika found a way to send them to us a decade ago in Connecticut. Think of it as a gift of gratitude from my mother, I said. It's nothing compared with what you did for us, Eldon added. The way you'll always be reminded of how you've helped us. I told Zorika. Her eyes became teary. We have your rocking chair upstairs. You have to see it. The one with the painted fruit? I surprised myself, picturing it so clearly. She nodded. You must take it home with you. My mother bought that chair, brought that chair to our living room when I was nine. I liked it because it reminded me of playing on seesaws and swings on the playground. I'd sit cross-legged on it, watching Bruce Lee movies while pushing back and forth. She'd yell when I tested how hard it could rock before tipping. I wanted to rock in it again to see if I could still fit. You remember more than Dan, Zorika said. He'll be home soon. He finished his economics degree, but there aren't any jobs here. He works as a secretary in a socialist party headquarters in town. I was glad Dayan's party wasn't nationalistic. I hoped he was against Milorad Dodik, the current Bosnian Serb leader who denied that the genocide ever took place. I was curious who Miloš was wait voting for, but that wasn't my battle. My head was still untangling the ethnic upheavals that almost killed us in the 90s, not the ten complicated Bosnian parties wrestling for power in the present day. I heard gun blasts outside and jumped, turning to the window. What the hell? I was about to duck down and crawl on the floor on my stomach. Don't worry, it's just a wedding convoy, Zorika said. They get drunk, drive down the street, and shoot guns to celebrate. I'm not worried. It's not 1992. I gripped the couch, couch's armrest and took a breath. Then I got up, moved the curtains, and saw that the convoy was already at the end of the block. When I sat back down, I noticed Milos staring at me. I remember the first time I saw little Keenan from the balcony of our old apartment, Milos said. I was in my uniform smoking. He poured us more moonshine. I'd just returned from the punk from the front. Those punks were robbing a poster of Alia Izetbegovic's face. I yelled at them to stop. Izetbegovic was a Bosnian activist the Serbs mistakenly claimed was pushing Islamic fundamentalism propaganda they'd used to attack us. You saw that? I suspected Milos was courting my affection by bringing up how he'd protected me from being bullied. First, I felt indebted and less alone, then spied on, then embarrassed at how weak I must have looked. Why didn't you tell me? You were more comfortable around my wife and son, Milos answered. Of course, I'd been uneasy around him then. He was wearing a Serb uniform and carried the gun he used to shoot my people. One of the mean kids was Velibor, Zorka jumped in. We knew his parents. I felt hurt thinking of that my karate teammates who'd turned on me. I found Velibor on Facebook. He works for Americans in Dubai, I said. All of the friends on Velibor's wall were Serbs. I could tell from their names. Not that I would ask him to friend me. The Balkanites I'd connected with online were mostly Bosniaks. Even our social networking connections remained segregated. Eldon was virtual friends with a cute Serb girl he knew from elementary school until he posted news of the war trials on his page and she defriended him. I knew Velibor's father from his birthday parties, I said. When the war broke out, he stopped saying hello. His dad lost a leg in the war and died soon after. Milos updated me. That's what he got for being mean to me, I thought as if I were still in junior high. I work out at the fitness center on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, my father was telling Zorika. Keenan and Eldon got me the best knee brace in New York. He lifted his pant leg to show her the lightweight gray plastic buckled around his knee. 
Next time, don't push him around a four hundred. Next time, don't push a four hundred pound cart around. Elton scolded him. I looked over at Dad, talking animatedly to Zorica. My legs were jumpy. I needed to go for it. This was my shot to cross-examine Milos and Zorica, and ask point blank why they'd taken Mil Musos home. Huso's home. My childhood was an unfinished puzzle, and they could fill in some of the holes. Mr. Milos, why did you and Zorica leave Croatia? I asked, amiably, using the polite address. Then I'd build up my courage to see if Milos would admit regretting the war. He finished his cigarette, poured another rakia. I drank more. It was loosening me up. We'd lived peacefully in Osijek since college and would have stayed there. But in 1991, my own people attacked our city. We were devastated, Milos said. Since I was a Bosnian Serb originally, I was harassed for my background. My neighbors in Croatia decided I was a collaborator and threatened vengeance. A death squad showed up at our door. People who'd eaten at my dinner table the night before suddenly wanted us dead. I sent my family to Bosnia ahead of me. One night, Croatian soldiers came to get me. Luckily, I squeezed out the back. I was beginning to understand why they'd sympathized with our plight and shown us compassion. Their experience mirrored ours. College-educated, open-minded, cosmopolitan parents, all of a sudden unfairly persecuted by friends and colleagues next door because of their ethnicity. But I couldn't, I didn't like his implication that Serbs were terrorized as much as Muslims during the war. How did you get to Birchkow? I asked. After we escaped Osijek, we needed a roof, Milos lit another smoke. Was it my interrogation making him nervous? I told Zorica we had to get a place that was legit with keys and paperwork. We didn't want to take anyone else's home, but we were forced to leave ours, so we had no choice. Luckily, the apartment had been abandoned. That was what I'd hoped to hear, that the timing checked it out. Huso's family had indeed left Birch Cow by then. Good, Milos didn't throw them out or greedily grab a second home. Forced to flee himself, he needed shelter for his family, felt entitled to Huso's empty place, and didn't feel guilty. That was my answer. I could check off number eight on my list. But now I was afraid that number ten would be much harder to nail down. I had to ask Milos if he regretted fighting against us. I could already tell my obstacle would be Milos's willful naivety. He didn't want to understand that an immoral legal system had allowed him to take Huso's home, using made-up paperwork designed to annihilate Muslims and appropriate all our belongings. And Milos in Zorica had stayed for years after the war ended. When did you leave Huso's? I asked. In 2001. We'd fled Bosnia in January 1993. I tried to calculate when they'd taken our furniture. Had they hoarded extra tables, chairs, and lamps and lived there with both sets for eight years? How did you know, Huso? Zorica asked. She appeared taken aback by my link to the rightful owner of her former apartment. It was the first time we'd ever discussed how close we were to the previous occupant. My father grew up with his dad, I said. He was a professor. Yeah, he gave Keenan English lessons. He was a tough grader, my father nodded. But he seemed not to notice my ulterior, un, ulterior motive, as if we were just catching up on old friends we had in common, and not unraveling the fate of a Muslim family just like ours, whose home had been stolen. Hilsho's father was nice to allow us to stay until we built our new house, Milos said. I nodded, pleased that this confirmed what Huso had told me on the phone the day before. Still, it seems surreal that two families we were close to had lived in the same apartment below us for years, sleeping under the same covers and overlapping in our lives, yet remained strangers and enemies to each other. It was like being caught in the middle of a nightmare that nobody could wake or recover from. Mrs. Zorica, why didn't you come up to visit us that day? Or why did you come up to visit us that day? I asked. Kids were picking on you. We learned you were the only Bosniaks in the building. 
We know how it felt being betrayed by friends. We didn't care about religions. We just saw a family like ours. We heard your name and recalled that my uncle knew your grandfather. Crazy coincidence about Grandpa Murat, Eldon said, catching on, looking tense. Feeling buzzed, I reached for my shot, my shot glass out for Milos to refill. I'll get lunch, Zorika said. I got up to follow her. Where are you going? Eldon asked nervously. What was he, Homeland Security, afraid I'd interrogate her in the kitchen? I'm helping her. I brought out bowls of veal soup. Then I carried out trays of her cucumber salad with sour cream and onions, cold baked veal, uh, roasted chickens with peppers, and salty sliced potatoes that I ate with abandon. Eldon talked to Milos about how the Americans were trying to become the next soccer powerhouse. I checked on my dad. He was quiet, as usual, when it came to food. It was just him and the plate. When he was done, Zorica asked, Have more, spooning us both another helping. For the last five years, I'd missed coming home to the aroma of my mother's cooking. Never sure which meal she stirred, sautéed, diced, or blended with what delicious ingredients. Even in the cafeteria at my college dorm, my roommates and I would choose from an array of entrees, appetizers, and desserts. It felt so nice to once again be sharing a big spread with a mix of tastes. I didn't expect each dish offering a surprise. Uh, I tired of planning small meals in advance. Shopping for myself, preparing everything I ate, mostly alone at my own table in Queens. More veal? Zorica asked. I nodded. She served me another chop. Nothing was made with pork. I was sure it was out of deference to us. Every time I finished eating, she put more food in front of me, patting my head, pleased I was enjoying her meal. Bosnian women were so nurturing. Nobody cooks for you in New York. Eat, eat, sin. Uh, she said, calling me son. It made me miss my mom. I'll never forget how you bought me, brought me sweets when I was hungry, I said. I wished we could have brought, done more, but when I visited, I was scared for our lives, she told me. I feared someone might retaliate, but Milos was away fighting. That's why I came up late at night. We thought you'd be like Daka, stealing Mom's stuff, Eldon explained. Oh, Daka, that bitch, that stupid pig, Zorka spat out. Now I was taken aback. Clearly, I wasn't the only one with leftover anger. This was getting more interesting. Eldon woke up from its soccer talk and asked, Wait, how did you know Daka? She looked at Milos, raising her brows. Tell us, I said, intrigued to learn the fate of the sadistic couple who'd menaced us. Daka and Boban were how we found your building, Milos jumped in. He was hanging around the village where Zorica's parents lived. We were stationed there. Boban was in the trenches with you? Eldon asked. No, he never fought, Milos said. He roamed around looting with his uniform in Uzi. I told Boban I wanted to move my family to Birchkow. He reached into his pocket for keys and said, Don't worry, the owner's gone, you can feel at home. Milos aped Boban's Belgradian accent. The blustery, guttural imitation was dead on, like it was yesterday. I was pleased to have, I was excited to have a common enemy. I wanted to connect the dots to see this strange story so long after it happened. How did Boban get the keys to Huso's place? Who the hell knows, Milos said. They were Belgrade Mafia School. So whatever happened to Daka? Oh, you're going to love how her ending, her... Oh, you're going to love how her reign ended in Birch Cow, <laughs> Zorika smiled. You guys escaped January 3rd, 1993. Every January 3rd, Eldon and I had a shot of whiskey together, toasting. This time, 18 years ago, we were on the bus. Zorika, knowing the date, made me see how intertwined our families were. We would have gone hungry if not for them. Their home would be barren if not for us. 
Right after you left, Daka came looking for Milos to carry something to her place, Zorka said. He wasn't in, so she grabs my cousin, who comes back three hours later, flustered his shirt undone. She came on to your cousin? I was fascinated. Daka had me take stuff into her bedroom. Had she also tried to seduce me at twelve with cookies, candies, and letting me play with her Uzi? Honey, she and Boban were filthy criminals. Jewelry, Zorika said. She managed to find Milos in the trenches, where she spent nights with the soldiers. She showed him naked pictures of herself. She talked him into taking speed and convinced Milos I was cheating on him. Daka was bad news. Milos didn't... Daka was bad news. M Milos didn't deny she'd come on to him. Who knows if she and Boban were even married or related. Zorka brought us mineral water with a Serb cross and eagle on it. They might be liberal, but they supported their own. I recalled how much my father hated Daka. I looked over to see if he was still eating and eating. Just, but I looked over to see he was still eating and eating, like he'd just come out of the camp. When Boban went to Belgrade for good, and Daka was packing, armed men with some kind of competitive lures barged into her house. They tied her wrist with wires and beat the hell out of her and took all her stolen stuff. Z Zorika smirked. We heard her face was unrecognizable. Karma got her in the end. She crossed her arms. Men beating up a woman disturbed me. They should have just taken her stuff and left. Well, my mom would be happy Daka never got our place, I said. Beer? Zorka asked. I expected the gold Serbian label Yelen with the deer on it, but I was pleased to be served Lashko from Slovenia, a neutral label, pouring it for us, even though a simple brewski had been politicized in this place. So right after you left, my mother moved in. So right after you left, my mother moved in. She had to leave her home and the Croats took our village. My mom gave her, me her keys. A month later, armed Serbs barged in and kicked my mom out, saying she had no right to be there. But really, they just wanted to keep the place for themselves. I took a sip of beer. So Serbs kicked a Serb out of our apartment. Keenan, it came down to greed and power. They were ruthless, using rifles to terrorize an old lady. She sounded like she'd never recovered from the war. None of us had. Toward the end of 1995, when the Bosnian army got their hands on heavy artillery, it wasn't even safe to go outside. Once, right after Dayan walked in from playing, two mortars fell by the side of the building. All your old friends would have been killed if it, they hadn't scattered and gone inside minutes before. We were all packing our bags, afraid we'd be run out of Birchkow. I'd always fantasized about seeing the people who'd taken my town forced to flee in panic like we did. But if my family hadn't been able to escape, it now occurred, me that, occurred to me that we could have been killed by friendly Bosniak fire in our own home. I remember the first time I went upstairs to bring you guys canned goulash. Keenan was on the floor playing miniature cars, Milos said. As I stood above him, he just sized me up, then looked away. That's when I knew he was a tough guy. Since he brought up that moment, I wasn't missing my chance. I felt the heat in my armpits, sweat dripping down the side of my ribs. I was only twelve, I said. What did you expect when men wearing the same uniform as you took Dad and Eldon to the camp? Zorka glanced at her husband. Eldon glared at me, crossing his arms over his chest, but I didn't back down. It really confused me how you could fill our propane tank and stomachs one day and then shoot Muslims the next, I admitted. Dad stopped his fork mid-potato. I was afraid you'd kill us too, I went on. Eldon rubbed his cheeks pushing the skin on his face with fingers. But everyone turned to Milos, as curious as I was to hear his reply. I didn't want to take anyone's life. I tried not to. I hated it. 
Milos put out his cigarette, then lit another, squinting, extremely uncomfortable. I prayed my bullets wouldn't hit anyone. I hoped no soldier would get close, so I'd be forced to defend myself. He looked so intense as if he'd just come from the trenches and was reliving the worst experience of his life. I heard the sorrow I was hoping for in his voice. I had no doubt he was sincere and rueful. I was amazed. Here was a military man from the enemy side showing remorse. I'd ask him what I'd came to find out. He had to dig deep and come far emotionally to answer me. I waited so many years to have this conversation, but it wasn't enough. Wired, I wanted more. It was a volunteer army, you know. There were Serbs who fought on the Bosnian side or left the region, I told Milos. Eldon sighed loudly to signal me to shut up. Dad put his utensils down. Well, every town was different. We heard deserters would be shot, Milos said defensively inhaling smoke. If I didn't pick up this rifle, I was afraid they'd kill my, me and my family. Ninety percent of Yugoslavians didn't want this war. Look at us now. Nobody has anything except the politicians. Ten political parties. I told my son if the war ever returned, forget all your stuff, just grab your passport and leave. But who were you fighting for? I pushed. My brother cleared his throat, then blew air out of his nose, making a noise like a dolphin. I was defending Yugoslavia, Milos said, raising his voice, his arms wide, palms up. Defending it from what? I asked. All the secessions from the Union that would take our land, flicking his cigarette in the ashtray. Aha, so that was his delusion. He'd been fighting for Yugoslavian unity. He was brainwashed to think that the people from Croatian and Bosnian republics were some kind of separatists or terrorist rebels who started a war, unarmed and unprepared, just to impinge on his freedom. But Milosevic's plans for greater Serbia were what made the Croatians and Bosnians need to secede in the first place. How could Milos not know that? We used to be one strong, proud nation, he continued. Then. The Croat party demanded independence, and Izet Begovic wanted his due, and then Milosevic, that loud lunatic. He got one thing right, but that was all he had against the monster who uh, had us, who had started four wars in eight years. Loud lunatic was the best he could do. Then the West used our people as puppets to turn us against each other, Milos added. First he blamed the victims, and now he's pointing his finger at Americans. I couldn't hold it in any longer. Foreigners didn't detonate our mosques and destroy Catholic churches or murder their own countrymen. I set him straight. Eldon glowered at me, but there was no way I was quitting now. They didn't send my brother and father to a concentration camp or suit their neighbors in our gymnasium or drive a tractor to dislodge my grandpa's headstone. Even dead Muslims weren't left in peace. My heart was pushing me forward as I asked Milos the question that had tormented me for 19 years. When you came home from fighting one night, I was there when Dayan asked you if you'd killed any Muslims. Didn't you tell him that you were going out to kill Muslims? No, I never said that, Milos answered immediately. Dayan was only six. What did he know? He flayed his hand in the air. Cigarette between his fingers, ashes flying. Nothing was ever black and that black and white. You heard how the neighborhood punks talked. They played patriotic Arkan songs. It sucks you in. Yes, there is a mass Muslim grave outside of town that nobody was held accountable for. But I never killed anyone because of their religion. Milos looked horrified that I'd ever thought of him as a murderer. He wasn't angry at all. His eyes caught mine. They seemed to plead for my understanding, my mercy. Could I grant it? He did acknowledge the grave, a small concession. His hurt expression and protests, however naive, did soften me. I mauled over his case in my mind. He was an educated, moderate, orthodox Christian man. For the first time ever, I tried to see the war from a Serb's point of view. Milos did everything right, 
the way my parents taught us. He finished college, worked hard, married, and had children like you were supposed to. He had a good life in Croatia, until he was persecuted for his ethnicity. He was told, albeit falsely, that his government needed him to fight to save his nation. A law-abiding citizen, he believed those in power. He allowed himself to be taken in by their deception. No, he was not a brave rebel who stood up to corrupt leaders. He was a family man with a wife and a child to protect. But I had to remember that he never became bloodthirsty or power-hungry like Vad Perro or Merlis Ranco, slitting Muslim throats for sport or stealing for personal gain. He helped us. He was proof that not all Serbs wanted to suffer. Some of his people suffered too. Milos was a decent guy caught in an ugly, unjust battle. We would help anyone in need, Zorika popped in, abruptly taking a cigarette from her husband's pack, lighting it and inhaling quickly. Yes, I helped whenever I could, his voice cracked. When I saved this Muslim guy, Sayad Birch, from getting ball gunned down in his home, I could have been killed by my own men. Sayed Birch? Eldon leapt in. We know him very well. We just saw him, I stuttered. I stunned. He's one of the people I came back here to see. My best Bosnian friend growing up. My dad was buoyed by the coincidence. He was in my jazz band. The miraculous overlap was an undeniable sign. After all, Milos hadn't saved a former classmate of his or someone he grew up with. Milos wasn't even from Birchkow. He'd stuck his neck out to help a Muslim friend of ours whom my father cherished. I was already leaning Milos's way, but knowing he'd risked his life for say had swayed me. Milos had it tougher than I'd thought. He'd tried to please all sides, protect his family, take up arms with his comrades, while, at, while secretly not wanting any Muslims to die. The verdict was not guilty. The defense was the insanity of war. Is there anything else you want to ask me that will help you understand? Milos's fatherly tone melted me, turning me twelve again. No, I nodded at him and stopped asking questions. He gave me what I needed. Thank you. Eldon smiled, spent. We just saw Sayed yesterday. Who knew? They, Dad was still marveling at the link. So let's have another shot. Milos poured us another rakia, and we all toasted. I leaned back, relaxed. It was six o'clock, hard to believe we'd been here six hours. Despite myself, I felt safe and comfortable. I had moonshine, beer, and Bosnian food in my belly. I felt heard, respected, and cared for in a Serb home. They were treating us like their own. For dessert, Zorika served crepes with homemade plum jam. I have Nutella, your favorite, Keenan. I clapped like a little kid and put a spoonful on my crepe. I believe the line, all it takes for evil to triumph is for good to n men to do nothing. But Milos had done something. He told Serb to turncoats not to bully me. He filled our propane tank. He gave us food and money to escape. He saved Sayad. Yes, I was disappointed with his everyone was to blame excuse but rationalizing ethnic cleansing. Perhaps Milos was too proud to just admit that his side was wrong, yet this was as close as I'd ever come to an apology from anyone in my country. I could cross number ten off my list. Come on, we're not rationing Nutella. She spooned a lot more of the hazelnut spread for me. It's not the war anymore. When Dayan came home, we shook hands, then hugged. He was slightly taller than me. His eyes and smile were the same. So was his blonde hair, except for the short buzz cut. Should we play war games around the house? I joked. For once I get to win? Dayan smiled. He told Dad, For years, I beat everyone in chess because of you, Mr. Kekka. He told us a little about his life now. He didn't drink, smoke, or go to bars. He was a homebody with a long-term serious girlfriend though he was six years younger than I was. 
I know some nice Bosnia girls I can introduce you to, Milos offered. What are you studs waiting for? Zorica asked. They haven't found us yet, Elvin stole my line. Yeah, you should find a nice girl here to take back with you, Dayan said. Now I was the one on the spot, for still being single. If we'd stayed in Bosnia, I'd be married by now, but they didn't understand the limitations I faced. They didn't know that I couldn't support a family in New York. I could have barely afford my rent and student loans. With the war and, and then starting over in a new country where I had to cover my own college and nurse my parents through illnesses, I'd fallen way behind where I thought I should be by 30, financially and emotionally. I was afraid I could never catch up. My father and I went out to the backyard to pick a few plums from their prized fruit trees. They're good people, but we see different worlds through the same binoculars, Dad said quietly. If Milos admitted he was wrong, everything he fought for in the last twenty years would be a lie. It's easier to be disappointed by someone else than to admit you let yourself down. While Dad's penchant for staying neutral sometimes bothered me, it was probably the reason why we'd all survived. I need a picture of us all, I yelled when we came back inside, to add to our old photo albums. Do you know the story of how they got back to your mom? Sorika asked. It turned out the album's journey to America was as jagged as ours. When we'd escaped in 1993, we each carried one photo book with us but five albums with our childhood pictures were left behind. Meanwhile, Zorica's mother moved into our Birchko apartment. When Serbs threw her out, Zorica quickly rushed our paintings and furniture into their own place and rescued our albums. Thievery had its upside. Because Zorica and Milos had taken my old friend Huso's place, I knew their phone number by heart. So when Birchko was reconnected to international long-distance phone service in 2003, Mom got back in touch with Zorica. Remembering how Serbs had destroyed and cut Bosniak faces out of their family albums, my mother begged Zorica to get our photographs to Great Aunt Fatima. Before she died in 2002, Fatima handed the albums to Grandma Emina. By 2004, we'd scraped together enough to fly Grandma to America where she'd arrived carrying baby pictures of Eldon and me in her arms. On our living room sofa in Connecticut, I sat between Mom and Grandma as they turned through the recovered photographs. Look at you. You were one week old there. Mom pointed to my first baby shot. Jeez, I knew I'd weighed only about four pounds when I was born, but I didn't ever recall seeing this picture before. I looked like a scrawny mouse. There you were, full, though you were full term, you were just two kilos, much smaller than Eldon, Grandma said, repeating the saga of my birth, which I hadn't heard in years. The doctor warned us that you were too little and might not survive. I yelled, you're crazy, I'm taking my baby home to make him bigger and stronger myself, my mother told me. Grandma chimed in, she told the nurse, He'll get fatter and meaner than everyone else. You'll see. They were so mad when she took you home early. And three months and three months later, I brought back my eight-pound boy with big fat cheeks. Mom concluded proudly, kissing my face as Grandma rubbed my hair. Now I filled Zorica in on the sad coda to the story. When Mom died, I took her beloved albums to me with, with me to Queens. I put them on a high shelf in my closet. I didn't look at them again until 2011, right before our Bosnia trip. While stressed out and searching for my mother's address book to find Zorica's new phone number, I went to the closet and impatiently pulled down all our recovered Bosnian photography albums. But the bin was too heavy and almost fell on my head. Trying to catch it, I wound up twisting my back into a spasm. I'm not nervous about visiting our past or anything, I joked to Eldon. I showed him what else I'd found among my mother's belongings. She'd kept the silver key to our birch cow apartment, 
as if, despite her protest, she'd always planned to return home. I pulled my camera, posed everyone, and took a bunch of pictures on my digital camera and cell phone. On my last trip to the Caribbean, I'd snapped 10 photos in 10 days. In less than a week in Bosnia, I had already taken 500 photographs. It was obsessive. But at 12, I hadn't had a camera. I felt the need to document every corner of my country, as if to compare the present with the vision stuck in my head. Impulsively, I sent one of the pictures of me, Eldon, Milos, and Zorica to Huso in Sarajevo. I was hoping to introduce, to sort of introduce them this way. I had a fantasy that I could make peace between our three families, show them when we were Showed them we were good people who just got entangled in a bad war none of us wanted. Huso texted me back a second later. Wow, that cabin you're standing behind was from my old apartment. I'm sorry, I didn't know. I felt queasy and culpable again, as if being friends with Milos and Zorica implicated me in this ghoulish Serb robbery chain. I was reminded once more that treasures stolen from Muslim families like mine were scattered among strange homes and could never really be returned or replaced. It's okay, he so texted me back. Dad, t Dad said he told Milos, take everything you want, just don't pull out the sinks or the sockets. I looked around their small, modest, unfinished home, filled with other people's ragtag, twenty-year-old furniture. Zorica's Croatian house had, taken, had been taken from her. Her family had also been persecuted for their ethnicity. She'd battled cancer. Milos didn't want to fight in the war. He was driving a cab to keep this roof over their head. They were victims too. Before we left Zorica and Milos's house, I crept upstairs to visit my mother's chair, which was in the first small guest bedroom. The door was open. Inside, beside a couch, I found the old rocker. I recalled how she used to cradle me, holding me close in her arms. I pictured the last time I saw her sit in the chair in 1991, before the war, when she was reading the book Zivu Pozli Zvota, which meant life after life, about people who died and were medically revived. I'd been interested because we were both superstitious. My fingers traced the grapes, pears, and peaches painted on the chair's headrest. I sat on the new blue pillow, rubbing the dark wooden arms. They were smooth as I remembered. I rocked back and forth hard, crossing my legs like I used to. It was surprisingly sturdy. I was relieved it ended up in a home where it was cherished, and not at some tag sale in Belgrade. For a second, I wanted to take it back to Queens with me. I pictured coming home from work to relax and sway back and forth in my little throne like I used to. Yes, someday when I had a wife and children and enough money, I would reclaim my mother's rocking chair, where I'd rock my own baby in my arms. And that's the end of that chapter.